Hi, I'm Matt Prater. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a guest speaker at our church and it's a blessing to have you joining us. Don't forget, if you'd like to find out more about our church, go to the website www.newhopebrisbane.org. Those of you that don't know me, my name is Barbara Ronell Salomas. And um, I truly count it a privilege and an honor to be sharing with you this evening. And uh, before I carry on, well, um, well, we have a, a very anointed minstrel in the house, brother guy, <laughs> and prophetic singer, Audra. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, so much happened in just that space of time. And the Lord showed me three things. Number one, somebody's waiting for an answer for something. And you've been checking the mail, and I saw an envelope floating, and there's been a release of something you've been waiting for. And expect an answer in the mail. And please testify. You know, come back and testify of what God's done for you. I don't know what it is, but um, expect something in the mail. And um, I said, Lord, what are you doing? And, and in Psalms it says, there's songs of deliverance. And the Lord says, I'm delivering my people. And as Audra was singing, as, as Guy was playing, there was just deliverance taking place. The songs of deliverance. And there was unlocking in people's spirits. And then I said, okay, Lord, and what else are you doing? And he said, you know what? Some of our hearts had been hardened through situations, experiences. And had I shared the word, it wasn't going to be able to be received and bear fruit in your life. And so the Lord said, I've got to go in and dig. I've got to go in and take out that hurt. I've got to go in and take out that pain. So that when my word is released, it can bear fruit in their life. Amen. Amen. So thank you so much to Guy and Audra and for Brad, for, you know, for first of all stepping out and saying, listen, I'm sensing the presence of the Lord. It was so sweet and awesome. And Lord, we just thank you so much for setting such an awesome plan, platform and an anointing for me to minister in. Thank you so much, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Um, today, I want to share on prayer, taking our position of trust and faith in the Lord. You know, prayer is something that God has designed for us to do. A lot of people think prayer is something the pastor wants you to do, something that is expected of you, do, of you to do as a Christian. But Jesus said so many times, when you pray, don't do as the hypocrites do. When you pray, go in secret. When you pray, so Jesus expected us to pray, amen? Yeah. Why does, why does God expect us to pray? Because in Genesis, the word of God says that God gave us dominion. He gave us dominion over the earth, amen? So if God gave us dominion over the earth, that means that when we go into our prayer closets and we pray, we are having dominion over a situation, amen? Prayer is not only going in and having dominion over a situation with Jesus Christ standing at the right hand with us, it's also a relationship with the Father. Sorry, I'm just going to come back a bit. Prayer is a relationship. For those of you that are married and or uh, are engaged, etc., you've got to communicate with your spouse or your partner. If you don't, the relationship will die. You divorce, you separate. And unfortunately, that's what's happening within the church. People are backsliding. They're leaving church because they've formed a relationship with the pastor or with the leaders or with the worship, but they haven't formed a relationship with the most important person, and that's Jesus. That's what prayer is all about. Prayer is going in and not doing the religious thing of, Okay, Lord, I meant to pray, so I'm going to come and pray. And then you like, uh, okay. No, that's not what prayer is. Prayer is fellowship. It's relationship. And sometimes you don't even have to say anything. It's just going in there, closing your door, and saying, you know what, Lord? I just wanted to let really you know that I'm here. I don't have anything to say. Like how we were quiet in the Lord's presence. And Brad said, you know what? I sense that we should just stay in the Lord's presence. And then you know what? He starts to move. He starts to say, okay, how about we do this today? How about we go this way today? 
how about we pray for your body that you haven't thought about in 10 years today? So that's what prayer is. Smith Wigglesworth, he used to pray for two hours before he would go out to minister to people. Catherine Kuhlman would pray for eight hours before she went onto the stage. But it's not about the amount of time that they spent in prayer. Because you know what? Everybody has got a different calling. But what I want to focus on, let's take Catherine Kuhlman. I've heard her messages. They really are not as fantastic as other speakers that I've heard. But she caught on to where the power was. The power is not in how much of a word you know or how much of a fantastic sermon you can preach. The power comes from spending time with Jesus. Because when you spend time with Jesus, he comes and he rubs off that anointing on you. If it's a business deal that you need a breakthrough at work, he comes and he rubs off wisdom on you. If it's healing that you want, while you're in prayer, he comes and he rubs off that healing anointing on you. And so many times we get it wrong. We think by the going to so many practices and going to so many meetings, and we miss it. There's nothing wrong with that. But the most important thing for you to do, whatever you're seeking God for, the answer is Jesus. Jesus is the answer. He's always been the answer. Amen? Amen. Catherine Coleman would spend eight hours. And you know what? Sometimes she would just preach uh, for ten minutes, and then she would just start declaring, the Holy Spirit is touching someone at the back and healing them of cancer. The Holy Spirit is talking to you, lady. Get up from your wheelchair. Was it Catherine Coleman? No. It was the Holy Spirit working through her. She had allowed herself to get to know him, get to hear his voice, get to understand when he wanted to move, and when she needed to shut up and just flow with the Holy Spirit. That doesn't come through common sense and, you know, attending meetings. It comes from a personal relationship with Jesus, the Lord and our Savior. You know, it reminds me of a time where I didn't have time to prepare my sermon. And I was going to go preach at a lovely church in Logan. And as I went into the meeting, I just, I said, Lord, okay, this is what I'm going to speak about. And I think that, and I've been waiting all week for the Holy Spirit to give me a word. And it never came. And I said, Lord, what's going on here? And you know, I got into the meeting and I was so desperate. And I was like, Lord, if anything's going to happen today, it's going to be because of you. Because... I didn't feel confident in the amount of time I'd spent studying and preparing the sermon. And you know, it was from that position of brokenness and knowing it's got nothing to do with me. If God doesn't turn up today, it's going to be a flat meeting and they're going to be like, that sister didn't study for the word, you know. And, but for me, it was kind of like, I don't want to have been sent and for no one to leave, for, for people to leave not touched by God, you know. And so anyway... It was from that brokenness and knowing that I've never felt like that before. That, Lord, you know, if you don't move today, not my will, but your will be done. It's going to be a disaster, you know. And from that position, and I was smiling and I was preaching. And inside I was like, Lord, okay. And you know what happened? It was like the Holy Spirit just took over. And people just started dropping on the floor. People started manifesting uh, demonic manifestations and coming on the ground. Lady, uh, there was a lady that got baptized in the Holy Spirit and wouldn't stop speaking in tongues. You know what? It's got nothing to do with me. It's the power of God. When you make yourself available and you say, you know what, Lord? Uh, Paul Yonggi Cho, he says 50% working in the church, 50% prayer. Because he knows where the power is. It's not in me for that business deal. If I'm not going to go in and pray, what am I standing on? my own labors, my own strength. How do I expect God to work on my behalf if I haven't gone and said, Lord, I'm taking my position of trust. That's what prayer is. I'm taking my position of trust and saying, I can't do this. I can't move the situation. I cannot deliver myself, but you can. I need you. Oh, I need you, Lord. 
And then God says, okay, when, um, when we are weak, the Bible says he's strong. And he comes in. It says, when the righteous cry out, the Lord hears us and he delivers us from all our troubles. But what does that scripture say when the righteous cry out? Some of us don't know how to call triple zero. Jesus says to his disciples, watch and pray. Some of us watch and complain. Oh Lord, I can see the devil attacking me. And we watch and we complain. We watch things happen to our bodies. We watch our finances going down and we take a position of complaining. And Jesus said, no. He said, watch and pray. Watch and pray that you don't fall into temptation. What are you doing? Do you watch and call triple zero? Meaning God here, by the way, <laughs> not the police. What are you doing? Why, aren't, why have we stepped back from the most powerful thing that God has given us? Can we all turn to Luke chapter 22, if you've got your Bibles? I love the word of God. The Bible says, uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I shall draw all men to myself. And so we lift him up by sharing his word and not sharing our own philosophies or ideas, but lifting up Jesus and his word. In Luke 22, I'll give you a little bit of a background. We find Jesus. They've just had um, communion. And, um, you know, this is just an amazing scene. Jesus knew his destiny. He knew his calling. My question to you today, do you know your calling? Do you know your destiny? If not, it's because you haven't spent enough time in prayer and in seeking God. A lot of people want to know their destiny and their calling, and they want to know from man's mouth. But if you want confirmation, if you want to really know what God has called you to do, go to the maker. Jesus was the perfect example of someone that prayed. He was always praying. And you know what? After ministering like myself, he would go and pray in the mountains. He was always praying. You know, when the, when the disciples couldn't deliver the demon-possessed person, he said, this kind come out not by prayer and fasting. And he prayed and he delivered that individual. Why didn't he fast? Because he loved that life. He loved the life of fasting and praying. And, and, and if we live by the Spirit and we're in prayer, we don't have to wait for a time to fast. We're operating in it and it's like, be gone in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so in Luke 22, uh, verse 21, Jesus says, and I'll read it. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. So what Jesus is sharing with his disciples is the person that's going to betray me is sitting amongst us. Imagine me in the meeting here <laughs> saying to you guys, by the way, the person who's going to lead me to the gallows is sitting here amongst us. <laughs> How would I have known that? Prayer. Jesus knew he was born to die for our sins. He knew how he was going to die. He knew who his betrayer was. How did he know? Through prayer. He spent a lot of time in prayer. And you know what? When you spend a lot of time in prayer, God can trust you with things like that, with secrets like that. Can God trust you today? If he had to show you something about your brother or sister in church, something difficult they're going through, for some of us, it'll be like, oh yeah, okay, Lord. No prayer. How many times has the Lord given you a dream or a vision about someone and you've done nothing about it? It amazes me how Jesus was so still and calm about the whole situation. But that's what prayer does. It gives you self-control. You already know what the outcome is. You know, if it's a business deal or if it, it's a relationship that, you worry, that you've been worrying about. When you're going to prayer, people will come to you and say, why aren't you worried? Your company is going down. 
But what they don't realize is that God's already shown you how it's going to pan out. You know, and you're in a position of peace. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and the Lord has said to you, he's given you that word when you be in prayer. Be anxious for nothing but by prayer and supplication. Make your request known unto the Lord. And the peace of God that transcends all human understanding shall guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So you have peace. And even though everything around you is falling apart, you kind of like smiling and they're like, she is really going crazy. But you're not. You know something that they don't know. You've been with the Father. It's like Jesus said, who do men say I am? And what did Simon Peter say? The Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen? You'll have revelations that other people don't have. I think Jesus was able to stay calm. If I, if there was someone, I mean, let's, let's, just, let's just go there for a little while. So let's just say I found out that it's Talitha that's going to betray me. How would you behave towards Talitha? Let's be honest. It'd be kind of like, can I don't talk to that girl? She's a sneaky one, I tell you. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But Jesus, what type of a person sits there having supper, you know, last supper, and he's cool and calm, and how did he get to that position? Prayer. He, you know, he, he trusted the Father. The Father trusted him, and he was able to keep calm and still be loving towards Judas. You know, have you, since you become born again, has someone ever come against you or attacked you? And when you took that position of peace and you gave the other cheek, were you ostracized and people were like, oh, you, you should have bashed that person or think back when you were in school or you should have said this and that and you kind of like, no. Because you had a revelation. You prayed about it and God said, don't go there. Just turn the other cheek. When we go into prayer, God gives us revelation. I want to take us to Simon, Peter, and the boat. But because of time, um, I'll just go over the story quickly. You know what happens when we spend time with the Lord and we allow him permission into our life? Some of us don't give Jesus the permission to work in our life through prayer. It's like, Jesus, why won't you do something? And he's like, my hands are tied until you ask me to do something about it. You know? Uh, how many of you have heard that the Holy Spirit is a gentleman? He doesn't just come and say, oh, by the way, I'm just, I'm going to do this for Talitha. No. Uh, sorry, Talitha. <laughs> he's a gentleman. He waits and he convicts and he stands. They're just encouraging you to do the right thing. Jesus I just preached to the multitude and he had no way where to separate himself from the multitude because they were pressing on him. So he sees some empty boats and he decides, okay, I'm going to go sit in one of those empty boats. Not like Jesus doesn't know everything. He already knows how things are going to pan out. So he goes and he sits in, in the empty boats and he ministers. And then after that, he sees Simon Peter. And trust me, I'm going somewhere with Peter because this guy is just a fantastic bloke. You know? <laughs> From what the Holy Spirit's been showing me this week. So he says to him, you know, throw down your nets. And Simon Peter says, we've been at it all day. You know, we've caught nothing. He says, but at thy word, we'll cast the nets again. And what do they do? He casts the net, and they get in this whole lot of fish coming in that he's got to go get others to help him bring the fish. And you know what happens? After everybody else comes in and brings in the fish, they share it out. And I want to ask you something. This is something the Holy Spirit showed me today. He said, had Simon Peter said, hello, that's my boat. What are you doing in my boat? We've been fishing all day. All this crowd might come and crash my boat. But he allowed Jesus, number one, into his boat, into his empty boat. Some of us have got empty lives, but we still won't let Jesus in. We're not praying anymore. Our finances have gone down. We've, our relationships are in a mess, you know. But we still won't turn to Jesus. But Simon Peter allowed Jesus in his boat. Today, will you allow Jesus into your life? 
Guess what happens when we allow Jesus in our life? He gives us a word. He said, Simon Peter, throw out the net. And he'll say to you, Barbara, go this way. Do this. And guess what? You'll get a return back. But how are you going to get a word like Peter if we don't go pray? And, and, and the most important thing that I can say today is don't sit on your problem. Don't sit back and think, oh well, Jesus loves me. So he, he's going to sort out the problem. No. Jesus wants to work together with you. He wants you to learn to grow in faith, to grow in strength. He wants you to understand why this is happening so you can go and help others. It's like a, a drug addict. You can't keep on, you, you've got to make them first understand that they've got a problem. So that in the end, they can be able to help themselves. And it's the same with Jesus. Sometimes he wants you to come through the journey with him and see where you open the door in the first place. But if you don't go and pray, how's he going to show you those things? Simon Peter went into prayer. He got a word from the Lord. He went and he fished and he came back with fish not only for himself, but for everybody else. Sometimes when you go and you pray, God will get you to intercede for other people. You know, oh. let's turn back. Uh, I want to show you something else. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Jesus said, he said to his disciples, could you not pray with me one hour? Mm. Let's go to Luke chapter 22, <coughs> verse 31. This is very important because I really think, and, and, and Pastor Matt shared this in his journal, and the Lord gave me a little bit of revelation, and I'm, we're going to read, and I, if you could just stick with me, I'm telling you, we're going somewhere. And it says, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. My question again, how did Jesus know that? Would you know if the devil was planning and plotting something against you? Would you know? Jesus knew. Keep that in your mindset while we go on to the next... Um, area. Now, where are you? Where are you? <laughs> okay. Mark chapter 14, verse 32 to 39. That's what happens when you can't find your stapler. <laughs> Mark chapter 14, Verse 32 to 39. I just love the Lord. I love His Word. You know, without the Word of God, I, we'd be so lost. And I praise the Lord for leaving us His Word. Verse 32. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And He said to His disciples, Sit ye here, while I shall pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be so amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Verse 36. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Verse 37. And he came and found them sleeping, and said unto Simon Peter, Sleepest thou, or are you asleep? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is truly ready, but the flesh is weak. 
And again he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And they weren't able to give him an answer. You know, how many of us think, have ever thought this? But if I was in the garden, I would have behaved differently. I would have prayed with my Savior. I would not have fallen asleep. I would have been there. How many have said that? I've said that so many times. But you know what? Jesus is saying the same thing today. When he wakes you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and gives you a burden for someone or for something, or you're busy washing the dishes or your car or watching a good movie, and you feel this prompting to pray. And you're kind of like, not now, Lord. I'm working home and away. Not yet. Wait until after home and away. I'll, I'll go pray. You know what? No. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You've missed it. Just like Simon, Peter, and John missed it. Jesus said, could you not watch with me one hour? At that moment, he needed you to intercede. It could have been a car accident. It could have been someone on their deathbed. But no, you could not watch. He said, you know, I could feel the heart of the Father yesterday on Friday. And you were saying, Brad, could you not watch with me one hour? Audra, could you not watch with me one hour? And we and we judge Simon Peter, you know, John and James, and we think they were so hard hearted. But hello, how many times have we done the same thing? Could you not watch with me one hour? You know, these guys, they, they were they were in the flesh. Well, let's go a little bit deeper. They couldn't, they couldn't catch on to what was going on. They didn't understand what was going on because they weren't people of prayer. Sometimes, I, I don't know about you, but I get so frustrated when I can so see what God wants to do. But it's kind of like, come on guys, let's go. And it's not people, it's, it's, it's just people haven't been praying. You know, and so we need to pray that people pray so that we don't miss the disciples didn't know that the greatest event in history, oh my goodness, was about to take place. Jesus was going to die for the sins of every soul that ever walked on this earth, redeeming us from sin, sanctifying us with his precious blood. And they missed it. Do you know who missed it the most? Was Simon Peter. Remember I said to you, Simon Peter, Oh, the Holy Spirit showed me something about Simon Peter. Jesus gave him a heads up. How many people here, God has given you a heads up? He's given you a dream or a vision, and you still don't pray. Jesus gave Simon Peter a heads up. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for your head, in other words. And Simon would have been the one person that should have stayed awake. My gosh, Satan wants my head, so I'm going to definitely be awake. I ain't going to be sleeping with everybody else. I'm going to be on my feet praying. He missed it. And you know what? The Lord showed me that Jesus had three disciples that he always took. They were like inner circle mates. You know, when they prayed for the girl that was dead, Jesus only took James, John, and Simon Peter. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, they go in, but he tells the other disciples to wait. And then he goes a little further and he only takes Simon, Peter, James, and John. And you know what? That's when he breaks down. And he says, my soul, my heart is so sorrowful until death. You know, Jesus kind of like what well, he wanted to tell them. But, you know, have you ever wanted to tell somebody something that God has shown you in prayer, like a revelation you've had? And... You, can't, you just can't explain it to people because they would have had to have been at this evening's prayer meeting for us to explain what happened with Guy and Audra and the Lord. You can't recreate it. And, and, and that's the, the problem with prayer. But it's a good problem. Is that it's something that cannot be recreated. I can't go and do it for you. You've got to do it for yourself. You've got to go get the revelation for yourself. I can share the revelation that God has given me but it's, it becomes wisdom 
when God reveals it to you for yourself. And so Simon Peter is taken into the most sensitive place of Jesus' heart. Imagine if Jesus had come to you in your bedroom and said, Brad, my soul is so, you know, it's really breaking for new hope. I don't know what to do. And then you fall back asleep. Did you feel that? But that happens nearly every night in this nation, the Lord told me. There are people that he set up as watchmen, prophetic intercessors, intercessors, and he's roaming to and fro on the earth. Chris, wake up, wake up, time to pray. And Chris is like, uh, yeah, Lord, in the morning when I get up, when he goes again, he's looking for someone else. Wanna, wanna, wake up, wake up, and he's so gentle. You know, he's got that self-control. And Mana says, okay, Lord. And she drags herself out and she's half asleep, but she's still wounding. She's like, I'm going to see you over your side. But at least Mana's got out, but then. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Why is the Lord having me share this? Because it's time to wake up to the things of the spirit. We are too sensitive to the things of the flesh. The power is in prayer. It's not in seminars. It's not in all the power is in prayer. And New Hope Brisbane are going after prayer. We had a leadership meeting here. It was fantastic. It went on until past 10 o'clock. But the leaders were praying. And, we, and, 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 and the, you know, it was decided that we would have prayer meetings and we would seek God out for our church. That's where the power is. Every revival that has ever taken place was because of prayer. I'll share something about our family. You know, before God uh, established and, and um, birthed moving forward, I was in a place, I'll tell you something, I was just had, had enough with church. I was just like, Lord, I'm just church home sleep, church home sleep. I didn't, it's, it, it was just dead for me. You know, and the Lord said, how badly do you want it? And I heard the Holy Spirit saying, can you really afford to sleep? When you look at the condition of your spirit, my kids didn't even want to go to church. When I'd say we're going to church, they'd be like, ah, ma, you tricked us. I have to trick them to get them into the car. Hey, Talitha, autumn. You said we were going for ice cream and taking us to church. You know? <laughs> Bad mommy. <laughs> Bad mommy. But you know what? <laughs> I had to pay a price. Everybody wants the power, but no one wants to pay. Listen here. There is grace. And God's grace is sufficient for us. But what are we talking about here? We're talking about relationship. I'm not talking about laboring. I'm talking about relationship. We've got it all wrong. I don't... God doesn't want you to come and into the prayer room out of um, religion and because Barbara said Smith <laughs> Wigglesworth prayed for two hours so I'm going to rubber baba I trust me, if you haven't been doing it for ten minutes, you'll last eight minutes or five minutes and you'll be so depressed you'll give up and walk out but it's about relationship so back to my personal testimony so anyway and I'm, and I'm ready to uh, another five minutes. And um, the, the Holy Spirit said to me, Barbara, can you really afford to sleep? It was straightforward. Because I, I was just sitting there having a conversation with him. And, and the way I talk to the Lord, sometimes just funny. You know, uh, we just sit there and just talk. And I'd be like, oh, did you see what a lovely dress, you know, um, so-and-so was wearing today, Lord. Dress. That's how I, uh, I talked to the Lord, you know, and I was like, Lord, you know, what? I'm so bored, so bored, you know, and he said, you're so bored because, you know, you're hardly spending time with me and you're doing the same thing over and over and over. How, how many of you feel like that? It's like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, wait, payday, payday, buy your groceries, put fuel back on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. No, that's not the type of God we serve. You know when Pastor Matt says testimony time, 
he should be having to say, no, okay, that's enough now. 50 people should be running up. Because the God we serve is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. He's, he's moving all the time. There should be, anyway, so back to my story. <laughs> so I, the Lord took me on a journey. I would get up, and my excuse was the kids. That was my excuse. Oh, the kids, Lord. And the Lord said, when the kids are in bed, you've had time to study for uni. So, you've, and I would study till 2 o'clock in the morning, but I wouldn't have 5 or 10 minutes for the Lord. How crazy is that? We've got how many hours in a day? And we don't have even 5 minutes. And then we say, Lord, why is my life like this? <laughs> anyway, I started on a journey, and for three months, the Lord took me from praying from 11 o'clock until about 3 o'clock in the morning. In the beginning, it was, I knew I wanted to get to a place in my relationship. I'm going to stress this, in my relationship with the Lord. I wanted to understand why my life was the way it was, my walk was the way it was. So I would study the word, pray, and I would listen to the Holy Spirit. And you know what happened in, the, in that time that I took time to separate to be with the Lord? The Moving Forward ministry was launched. God took me up to heaven. I, in terms of film and, and television, God began to network me with so many people. And I also learned how to pray. I learned so many things. I met so many different people. And God led us back to new hope. And look where I am. I'm talking to you guys. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know? Hi, if you'd like to find out more about New Hope Brisbane, you can go to our website, www.newhopebrisbane.org. Also there you'll find links to our Facebook and Twitter. And you can visit us any Sunday at 46 Kelvin Grove Road, Kelvin Grove.